Uh, okay, let's start next session with we'll talk by Yuri Pautanin about our current understanding of uh, ultraluminosis resources. Not only ULX, but ULX pulsars. <laughs> okay, so uh, good afternoon. So I was asked to talk about ULX pulsars. Uh, ULX is actually, so the plan of the talk is the following. I will spend a few minutes on talking about your, uh, ultraluminous X-ray sources in general, just a few general properties. And then I will switch to the new development in this field, uh, ULX pulsars. I will describe some observed properties. And then I will discuss our theoretical understanding of these sources. I don't think we actually understand how they radiate, but at least what we think we know about them. So uh, ultraluminous X-ray sources actually were discovered already in the 80s with the Einstein Observatory. And uh, these are bright X-ray sources in nearby galaxies which are not in the, their center, so these are not active galactic nuclei. And the definition was that they, sh they should exceed uh, the Eddington limit for a stellar mass black hole, 10 and 20 solar masses, because those mass black holes were expected to be the maximum possible that we see we should get from the cell revolution. Now, of course, we know with discovery from LIGO that we actually do have more massive black holes, up to 30 or even more solar masses. But uh, so uh, as we all, uh, see for easily from this picture of the antenna galaxies, that actually uh, ultraluminous X resources are associated with star forming regions. We see that the X ray sources, which are here on the right hand side, uh, and the star forming regions actually are sort of uh, related, uh, uh, situated close to each other. We don't know whether, or we cannot prove that X ray sources are within the clusters, but there are some associations. Probably they have been ejected from those clusters at some point of the, in the evolutionary stage. Uh, so uh, for the last probably 20, 15 years, people have been talking about uh, various models for U ULXs actively. And they were, most of these models were divided into two classes. Either these are high accretion rate stellar mass uh, black holes, because one expects that the black holes have high Eddington limit, so that it would be easier to exceed the Eddington limit by a factor of 10. Or these are sub Eddington accretion for, at on the intermediate mass black holes. As, and I will mention immediately that there are no any, indica any indications that intermediate mass black holes actually uh, contribute to the majority of ULXs. Probably some of the brightest sources could be uh, remnants of or the black holes. Uh, from some tiny galaxies, or, but most of the sources are clearly not uh, intermediate mass black holes. There were also suggestions uh, that this could be related to supernova, uh, like yeah, supernovas and rotation, young rotation powered pulsars, but they, uh, one doesn't expect that these sources will be strongly variables and uh, strongly variables, and we will see we see actually that ULXs are, uh, are strongly variables, variable. Uh, we, uh, already in about 2010, there were discussions in our group that uh, some of them could be X-ray pulsars accreting at high rates. And actually, already if you go to the old papers by Basco and Suniaev in the 70s, people have been discussing that uh, you know the, the neutron stars can easily exceed the normal Eddington limit by a factor of 10. Uh, if you have, uh, so basically most people agree that uh, most of the sources are super adding and accreting stellar mass black holes. And then you do expect that the accretion disk around these sources will not be a standard one, but actually there will be advection and there will be winds. And already in the classical paper by Shakura and Sunaev in 1973, this is a picture from there, uh, they predicted that if you have very super adding rate, you will produce a wind, and actually what the central source will accrete, it will be just the, about the Eddington. This model uh, didn't, uh, didn't account for advection. If you do account for advection, uh, then uh, you, in principle you can get a high accretion rate, so instead of having, let's say, uh, 1,000 Eddington, you can have 500 Eddington to the central source, and the rest will be ejected in, in the form of the wind. So this is the prediction, the dashed line, how the accretion rate will change with the radius for uh, in the shakura Sinaev model. But actually, including advection, you can get uh, different values for the final accretion rate. 
So, but this is concerning the black holes. Of course, if you uh, have neutron stars, the situation will be different. And uh, uh, in th three years ago, actually, the situation has changed dramatically. And uh, in the paper in Nature by Bacchetti et al., uh, it was discovered, by, the new star observatory discovered that uh, M82X2 source, one of the brightest uh, sources in this, in this star forming galaxy, is pulsating. So actually, people looked for pulsations uh, in, uh, in, for some of the sources with XMM Newton. I asked Mike Revnivsev and uh, Alexander Lutavinov in 2010 also to look for pulsations in some of the sources, but we didn't find any with XMM Newton. Uh, but uh, uh, recently, actually, two more sources were discovered uh, in the archival data with XMM Newton and then also with the new star. So I will briefly now go through each of those three sources uh, that uh, we now know they're pulsating. So we identify them as accreting uh, pulsars, accreting neutron stars. And uh, so this is the figure from uh, Bacchetti et al. was uh, shown the pulse flux as a function of time here. And one sees, the, so this is the pulse profile here, almost sinusoidal. And then the pulse uh, fraction, what is important, that pulse fraction is about uh, uh, 20 or even 30 percent. So these are strongly uh, variable sources with the uh, nearly sinusoidal profiles. On the upper graph, you see the variations of the period as a result of the orbital motion of the source. And for this source, we know that the period is, uh, orbital period is two and a half days. So one measures the mass function, and one can get uh, that the companion mass for reasonable inclinations is, uh, because we don't see eclipses, is about 5.2 solar masses. So if you take a normal sol uh, like neutron star with 1.4 solar masses and the companion more than 5 solar masses, then one understands that in this situation accretion is unstable. You have more massive companion transferring mass to the less massive object, so actually the system shrinks and you will have uh, a very high, uh, very high accretion going through the Roche lobe. So like in SS433 in our galaxy, probably, which accretes at 5,000 Eddingtons or something like that. Uh, so if you look at the variation of the uh, period, now the, here the variations are corrected for the orbital motion. So these are real variations of the pulsars. You see that there is a spin up uh, generally, so the period is uh, decreasing. If you look in this red box here, sometimes there is actually a small spin down. Uh, and, but but uh, basically, uh, the, the spin up rate is quite high compared to the normal X-ray pulsars. And uh, this uh, rather high spin up actually tells you something about the, the, that these are, uh, uh, the sources actually accrete a lot of mass. From the, from the period over period dot, you can estimate the time scale that the source should come sort of to the equilibrium, which is just a few hundred years. And if the typical time scale of the evolution of the system may be 100,000 years, you don't expect that we should be far from the equilibrium. Probably we are close to the equilibrium. And therefore, if you're close to the equilibrium, there are two torques. That is a magnetic uh, uh, torque that uh, tries to decelerate the star and the accretion torque that starts, tries to accelerate the stars, these two torques actually should be in balance. Therefore, the accretion rate, the P dot that you measure, uh, in reality doesn't tell you much because it's, uh, uh, this P dot is, uh, is a result of combination of two uh, torques of different signs. Therefore, it's very difficult to say anything from the P dot about the accretion rate and about the magnetic field, basically about the size of the magnetosphere and how much angular momentum you transfer to the, uh, to the star. But the maximum observed P dot uh, actually gives you the lower limit on the accretion rate. So because the maximum spin-up torque is just the accretion torque, uh, which uh, here you have the, put the rotational radius, in the accretion disk, and you can estimate from the p dot just m dot. And for example, m 82x2, for the measured maximum possible measured p dot, you will get the accretion rate. Of course, there should be some absolute value of this. Is a few times 10 to 18 grams per second, which is not actually much. It just gives you just a few times the Eddington luminosity, and you observe the luminosity, which is actually much higher. These are 10 to 40 ergs per second. 
So uh, here you have the flyer curve from the paper by Sergei uh, Luminosity versus time. And there's are uh, 15 points here, and as you see here, there are, these points are, uh, are in two different states. The bright state is about 10 to 40 arcs per second, and then there's a uh, quiescent state, sort of, which is 50 times, uh, the luminosity is 50 times weaker. That you see there is X2 here, it's completely, basically disappeared, and here it's very bright. So, and this uh, strong variability of uh, uh, the source can be interpreted as the signature of the propeller effect, as we interpret in this paper. And this would also uh, then mean that the source is close to the equilibrium, so where the magnetospheric radius is close to the rotation radius. Otherwise, of course, it's very difficult to change uh, luminosity by a big fra fraction, by a big factor. Here, the interpretation is that once the accretion rate drops below some critical value, the magnetosphere becomes larger than the rotation radius, and then the neutron star start working as propeller, as Sergei explained in his talk, and the accretion stops. Therefore, there is, you expect a huge drop in the luminosity just because the efficiency of accretion now, the matter doesn't fall into the neutron star, but uh, actually it stops at the magnetospheric radius, uh, which is 100 times bigger than the star. Uh, okay, so uh, this huge variability in the uh, luminosity is actually, as we will see later, is, it, uh, is a characteristic of, this, uh, uh, of, the, of those, all of these sources. So another source was discovered uh, just last year. The paper appeared this year. This is ULX1 in NGC 5907. Uh, it was discovered in the search in the, of the archival data. And uh, here uh, you see the XMM data from 2003, XMM data from 2014, where the signal is very, uh, I think the discovery was this one, this data. But then you can, if you can correct for the P dot, then you will see that there is actually a huge spike in the power spectrum density. And uh, in individual of observations, uh, you can measure, actually measure P dot here, which is very large, here is 10 to minus 8. Of course, this P dot is very difficult to say that this actually is related to the spin up of the star, just because uh, we don't have the orbit for this uh, object. So this could be related just to the, this change of the period can be related just to the orbital motion. But then, uh, uh, but, uh, there is a secular, secular uh, trend on the time scale of uh, uh, 10 years because you see the period was, uh, in 2003, it was 1.42 seconds, and now in 2014, 10 years later, it was 1.14 seconds. So clearly, if you just uh, compute what is the uh, change of the period uh, in this 11 years time scale, you will get this value, which is about 10 to minus 9 uh, seconds per second. And this gives you directly also the measure of the minimum possible accretion rate that you can have. So this is for this source, I put here the larger value which gives you very super accretion rate. If you put 10 times smaller, of course, you will still have uh, like uh, accretion rate which is uh, tens of the Eddington values. Uh, what's interesting that uh, uh, this 5907 shows uh, also strong periodic variations and here you have, which is interpreted as probably superorbital the period of 78 days, and you see that there is a nice sort of flight curve that goes for a few years. And uh, sometimes there, is a, there are drops here in the light curve, and uh, it's, it's easy to see in this paper by, from Israel. You see that uh, there is a typical luminosity of this source is now 10 to 41 arcs per second, the observed luminosity. Sometimes the source is completely unobserved, but so the luminosity drops by a factor of 100. So also there is a huge change in the luminosity. Okay, the spectrum of the source is sort of thermal that cuts off at somewhere 10 keV. And uh, this kind of spectra also are typical for uh, ultraluminous X-ray sources, all of them, and ultraluminous X-ray pulsars in particular. Uh, and all, uh, even from the shape of the spectrum, from the peak of the emission, you can say something about the emission region, the size of that. Because if you have 10 to 41 arcs per second, and you have the temperature of the plasma, of the color temperature that you observe, the radiation is, uh, let's say, few keV, the effective temperature is probably smaller. So therefore, you immediately say that the size of this emission region should be a few stellar radius, maybe, uh, you know, uh, three stellar radius or so. Uh, so it's, it's not very large, but it's not, it's, it, it can be a very small polar cap at the neutron star surface. Then the third source is uh, 
object in the galaxy 70, uh, GC7793. This is another paper by Israel. Here you see the pulsation, the, uh, the peak in the power spectrum density and the pulse profile. And uh, in, for that source too, you see huge variations in the luminosity. There is a peak luminosity there which is about 10 to 40. And then there are sometimes it's not observable at all. There is also a sacral trend, but here the P dot is uh, quite small. And in, the, in individual observations, you cannot even detect that, basically. Uh, what's interesting, yeah, so here's the luminosity. You see that it's in the, yeah, in the bright state, it's about 10 to 40 arcs per second. What's interesting that this source also show, uh, shows uh, variations about the same time scales, 65 days. And uh, it could be also superorbital. Some people claim at first that this is, uh, this is orbital variations, but this paper by who actually claimed that it's probably superorbital. Then the orbital is probably between three and seven days, similar to what we have for uh, MIT2. Well, it was two and a half days. But, uh, okay, uh, again, the pulse fraction is also very large. Here it's about 30% for this source. So here's just the uh, ULX pulsar as a nutshell. That's, uh, the most important things to uh, keep in mind here is that all the sources have large pulse fraction, 20-30%. There is huge variations in the luminosity by a factor of 100. Uh, the period is about one second, and the luminosity is built like 10 to 41, 10, 10, 10 to 40, 10 to 41. Okay. Now I will switch to some a more theoretical interpretation of what uh, we think is happening. First, let me remind you three characteristic radia that you expect, like we need to, to work with. One is the radius of the rotation, where the, the accretion disk rotates with the same velocity, uh, angular velocity as the neutron star. And for one second period, we have its, its 10 to 8 centimeters. So basically, it's 100 stellar radius. Second important radius is the spherization radius. You, you, you do expect, in, when you have high accretion rate, much above the Eddington, the, uh, the disk, the accretion disk itself becomes Eddington at some point. So you have a luminosity uh, exceeding Eddington at some point. And at this radius, one predicts that there, is, there will be a wind launch. So everything within this, uh, this spherization radius, uh, uh, the, the mass will be lost. So the accretion rate after that will not be constant. And for, for example, for M82X2, where the luminosity is about uh, you know, a few hundred uh, Eddingtons, you put here a few hundred, you get the spherization radius about exactly, almost exactly in the same place where we have the rotation radius, 10 to 8 centimeters. So this is the radius of the star here. Okay, and uh, the third uh, radius is the magnetospheric radius, of course, which depends on the accretion rate as well as the magnetic moment here. Uh, there are some coefficients here which depends on the disk structure, whether it's gas pressure dominated or disk pressure dominated, and then all uh, the complications. Uh, and this, value, this is not really a well-known uh, coefficient. But anyway, so I amazingly, uh, that because we expect that this, uh, all of the sources are close to rotation, the magnetospheric radius should be close to uh, rotation radius. And actually, uh, for the accretion rate of a uh, few hundred electron, even the spherization radius will be close to that. Okay, so this is the... Uh, picture from Kulkarin Romanova, it was for the millisecond pulsars, but uh, uh, general picture is still the same. You have a Christian disk probably slightly thicker than standard uh, thin accretion, like uh, gas pressure dominated thin accretion disk. And then you have the gas follows some uh, curtain and follows into the poles of the, of the star. And when, of course, the star rotates, you see the pulsations. But where the radiation is coming from, of course, it's not from the surface of the neutron star, as in the case of uh, accretion millisecond pulsars that Alessandro was talking about, but from all this curtain, from all this accretion uh, column. Okay, so one of the most uh, sort of uh, discussed questions in this business is how to interpret the luminosity that you see. Is the 10 to 40 ergs per second, or even 10 to 41 ergs per second, is the real luminosity of the source, or it is the luminosity that is actually you observe only, and you know other observers see almost nothing? So whether the radiation is actually strongly beamed. Uh, people have been discussing this beaming in the, in the context of accretion black holes, where you do expect the inclination of this by the wind, by a factor of maybe 10. Uh, for the neutron stars, the situation obviously it has to be some, somewhat different because the magnetospheric radius is 100 times the stellar radius. Therefore, it's very difficult to launch the wind just because the 
the accretion disk stops at much larger radius. And in the papers by King and Asota, in a couple of papers, they still assume strong beaming. And by assuming strong beaming, you reduce the requirement uh, for the accretion rate uh, by some factor, not by a factor of 10, 20, by a factor of 5. Because uh, if you reduce, uh, so basically by assuming strong beaming, you say that the accretion, the neutron star sees, get much smaller luminosity by a factor of, let's say, 10 to 20. So it's just a little bit above Eddington. Okay, but the accretion rate is in reality about 40. So when the matter, a lot of matter goes in, at spherization radius it starts to be blown away, and you lose 90% of this material into the wind, which collimates the radiation. Okay, and only 10% falls to the neutron star. So for for this model to operate, the require in the paper from 2016, for example, that magnetospheric radius is very small compared to the uh, spherization radius and rotation radius. And then magnet magnetic field that you get for that, if you assume the small uh, magnetosphere radius, is just 10 to 11 Gauss. Okay. Uh, here in, in this model, specific model of this 2016, of course, the question first arises, how do you get huge variations in the luminosity? Because you don't expect that the accretion rate will react very rapidly and uh, on, in the outer accretion rate, and the accretion disk reacts very rapidly, and, the, you, the, by, and you change m dot by a factor of 100. So it's very difficult to imagine. Uh, and of course, then another question is, if you have collimation of the, by the wind, how you can get a big pulse fraction, and how you can get sinusoidal variations? So there is no model for that. You want to just assume that you have some radiation from the pulsar, which is reflected from the walls of this funnel and collimated towards you, but uh, naively you wouldn't think that you will lose uh, pulsations uh, because you don't expect that there is a laser beam as this one pointer that shines on the walls of, the, uh, of this uh, funnel, uh, but you expect rather broad emission pattern from the, from the accretion pulsar, from the accretion pulsar, and uh, therefore you will lose most of the pulsations. So uh, personally, I don't believe in the strong beaming by a factor of 10 or 20. Maybe there is a factor of 3 beaming, but not more. So if you don't have strong beaming, then you automatically say that, okay, your accretion rate is really tens of Eddingtons, maybe 100 Eddingtons. But uh, then if you want to have a uh, system in equilibrium, magnetospheric close, uh, radius close to the gravitational radius, then this automatically tells you that the, the magnetic field of the star should be very large. Of course, it depends still on the model of the accretion, uh, like uh, accretion disk interaction with the magnetosphere, but it's, it's, it cannot be 10 to 11 Gauss. It's probably close 10 to 13 or uh, 10 to uh, 14 even Gauss. So uh, for M M82, uh, so if you assume that magnetospheric radius is just close to the gravitational radius at the maximum luminosity or some 10 to 40 arcs per second, uh, uh, then you immediately, so the rotation radius and the magnetospheric radius uh, relate like that. And so then you get the relation between the magnetic moment or the magnetic field and uh, the luminosity. So the accretion rate, you say, it's just you get from the luminosity. So, uh, and the period, which is, of course, comes in this formula. So the, on the y axis, you have luminosity times the uh, orbital uh, spin period into some power 7 third. And you just can read the magnetic field from this graph because there should be just relation between the magnetic field, the luminosity, and the period. There is some coefficient of proportionality. And you can test this relation on the sources where we know magnetic field. From by, uh, so he, these are the sources where you measure magnetic field from cyclotron lines. SOX 18.8 is a millisecond path where we, you can sort of measure magnetic field from the spin down there uh, when it's uh, uh, b between the outbursts. And this uh, theoretical relation actually holds very well. So then if you believe this interpretation that M dot is actually corresponding directly to the luminosity, then you just read off uh, the magnetic field and it becomes few times 10 to 13 at least. Okay. Another question that uh, is discussed a lot is actually how to exceed the uh, Eddington limit. Because uh, you can supply the neutron star with the large accretion rate, 100 times the Eddington, but somehow the radiation should escape and not stop the accretion. Uh, first, of course, we should remember that even the accretion disk itself can exceed the Eddington limit because radiation from the accretion disk goes like normal to the disk, gas flows along the disk, 
So there is, uh, it's not so easy to interact with these photons with the, with the disk. So standard uh, sort of advective disk can easily go like 10 times the Eddington. Here you have another situation also, you have this accretion curtain, which could be very thin curtain, and uh, so the gas falls down, and the photon goes sideways. So you have emission, fan emission, fan, fan beam, sort of so photons escape sideways, and the, radiation, the gas falls onto the neutron star. So these other papers have discussed recently all this, uh, or not recently even, all these ideas. Uh, second effect that can help to exceed the Eddington limit is so-called photon bubbles. So the, the, the accreting gas becomes strongly inhomogeneous and the photon can escape between the, uh, between this uh, inhomogeneities. It's like uh, if you accrete the, uh, the bricks, then of course the, the bricks will not feel the same, it will not produce the same Eddington limit as the uh, uh, gas. And the third effect is that if you have strong magnetic field close to the surface, then you can reduce the opacity because the, for at least for one polarization, uh, it goes like energy square. And if your magnetic field is like magnet are like 10 to 14 Gauss, then this factor E over I cyclotron energy square could be easily a factor of 10,000. So you can easily reduce your opacity by uh, a large fraction. And therefore, you can exceed the energy limit. Of course, this argument for the reduction of the of the opacity works close to the neutron star, but once you go 10 times the stellar radius, it stopped working just because the magnetic field in the, of the dipole field goes like r to minus 3. Therefore, at 100 stellar radius, it becomes <laughs> 1 millionth of the original one, and basically there, the opacity is Thomson. Then the question is what happens to the gas that actually tries to go to the magnetosphere? Uh, so here is just a reminder of how, what, where the photons uh, uh, are coming or that you observe. Some of them coming from, this, from the surface or from the column close to the neutron star. Some of these photons can be reprocessed in these curtains, and some of the photons can come from the accretion disk, and these are the softest ones. But uh, here still the question is uh, what happens to the gas? How you can push the gas towards the neutron star? Because there is a radiation force that exceeds you know, the gravity force by a factor of 100, because these are super Eddington sources, right? Of course, the, the gas in this flow is confined by the magnetic field, so it's uh, the really not, the gas cannot be really pushed easily away, but uh, still, the gas tries to fall in, but the radiation will stop it. So, of course, this flow is optically thick, so therefore the radiation force that will be acting only on the surface layers of, of this, uh, of, of this uh, layer, uh, of this curtain, and the rest of this will probably not feel uh, the radiation. But uh, the dynamics of this is not uh, actually, nobody has solved this problem yet. So this will be a very interesting prob problem for some PhD, clever PhD student. So uh, Maxim Lutikov discussed this problem exactly, and he suggested that actually our neutrons should be basically orthogonal rotator, and then uh, accretion disk uh, will go directly to the poles of the neutron star and the photons will just escape sideways without really interacting with uh, all this gas. So th this way actually you can sort of collimate the matter in the very thin sheet and then the, photo uh, the, the photons will escape sideways. But uh, uh, th this is an unsolved problem actually how you push the gas uh, through all this curtain to the neutron star. So, uh, so uh, from the so, so here I plot the luminosity, observed luminosity of the object versus the magnetic field. And on this diagram, there are a few lines that one should, uh, you know, one, uh, important to notice. Uh, there is a line here on the top is uh, uh, written supercritical accretion disk. This line means that above this line, the magnetosphere becomes smaller than the spherization rate, no, oh, sorry, it's larger than the spherization radius. So you have high accretion rate and therefore you will start producing the wind. So it does mean that uh, this region is forbidden for us, but it means that you lose some material in the wind, so not everything will be falling down. There is this thick line uh, that is prediction from some simplified model of the accretion column, uh, like uh, Alain Baskov-Sunayev uh, from 1976, that was produced by Alexander Mushtukov. And this is a simplified model of what would be the maximum possible luminosity from the uh, accretion column of size about stellar radii. Of course, this is not absolute limit because you can have some effects that were not accounted for this model. 
Okay? And then there is this, this dashed line for different periods. These are corresponding to the uh, equilibrium between the spin up and spin down. Basically, if you are below this line, then the magnetic field is too strong and there will be propeller effect. So your object should be probably below this supercritical line, probably below this thick line, but not necessarily, and certainly above this dashed line. So now if you, we take M82X2, this is this orange circle there, the period is 1.37 uh, seconds, so it should be above this dashed line, or at this, just because if it's close to the equilibrium, and then the sort of consistent solution will be 10 to 14 Gauss uh, magnetic field, and uh, yeah, for 10 to 40 arcs per second. If you take this object 77 uh, uh, in NGC 7793, luminosity is about the same. Uh, period is smaller, therefore the, the spin up, uh, sort of the propeller line is to the left. Therefore you do expect somewhat smaller magnetic field, otherwise you will you'll be in trouble. And then for 5907, which is 10 times brighter, you are actually in trouble because it's becoming, uh, it's clearly exceeding the supercritical accretion disk line, so you'll you have to produce the wind, and it's much above this dashed line. It's okay with the propeller line, but uh, in order to get this uh, object to fit into this picture, probably you have to assume some moderate beaming by a factor of five, maybe, and uh, this probably also means that this model of the accretion column is not the final one. Probably we, somehow we have to think how to produce even higher luminosity from this accretion column. Uh, okay, so I switch to my conclusions, as my chairman tells me to do. <laughs> and uh, so the thing is uh, to, to take away here is that we now know that uh, pulsars, X-ray pulsars, can exceed any limit by a factor of 100 or even uh, 500 at least. Uh, even if you account for beaming, it's probably they exceeding the electrical limit by a factor of 100. Uh, my guess is that there is no strong beaming uh, involved, maybe by a factor of a few. Uh, we do expect that the sources are close to equilibrium and therefore uh, you just, from the period, you immediately can tell you what's magnetic field and for some sources you, you do get uh, fields of 10 to 13, 10 to 14 Gauss. And probably there is a problem with the interpretation whether you can have a magnetar uh, like magnetic field in the objects which are probably a few million years old. Uh, highly superangular accretion you, or highly superangular luminosity can be arranged using different factors, geometrical effects, reduced opacity, and photon bubbles. So that doesn't seem to be a problem. Uh, it is probably. Still a problem to get luminosity, which like is uh, 1,000 Teddingtons from the neutron star. Getting 100 times the energy luminosity is not a problem for sure. I think I will stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, now we have time for questions. Two questions. Uh, the first one, uh, how long uh, such uh, systems uh, live and uh, can you estimate the symptotic values of the spin periods uh, using your P, P dot and uh, P dot dot? Yeah, I, I think the, the, li uh, the lifetime is, uh, people estimate, I, I don't think it's more than 10 to 5 years, probably 10 to 4, 10 to 5 years. The, so because you have accretion rate which is, you know, 10 to minus five or 10 to minus six solar masses per year. So uh, they can, those systems cannot live long. Uh, uh, then the, uh, the final period, uh, you can estimate from the magnetic field, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but I think, uh, it, it, of course, it depends on the accretion rate, if they will be accreting all the time uh, like that. One millisecond, ten millisecond. No, I don't think these are, because the, if you believe in these strong magnetic fields, you, you cannot go to millisecond periods. I mean, uh, th this is the difference from what we are saying. We, 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 oh, our group says that we are close to the equilibrium. So this is basically your final period. <laughs> but uh, a, a group, uh, for example, by Andrew King, they say that you have much low magnetic field. So your magnetosphere is much lower, smaller than, and then uh, this of course means that you can accelerate the star much, uh, much stronger. So, and, and then this would mean that now we are out of the equilibrium, obviously. Yeah. Uh, 
the second question. That was the second one. Uh, um, how uh, your results will be changed uh, uh, for different inclination angles uh, between the magnetic mo moment and the rotation axis? Yeah, I mean, we haven't computed really how the uh, how, how this geometry affects uh, or the pulse profiles or the obviously you do expect you do need some inclination to get pulsations. Otherwise, you would not have any pulsations. Uh, but you have used uh, the orthogonal uh, geometry. No, yes. I, I I mean for the estimates uh, estimates of the magnetospheric radius, we just used yeah, the basically aligned uh, rotator. So. But of course, this is just estimate. You, you have uh, once you are inclined by some degrees, of course, you will have some instabilities. Who knows? But I don't think it will change dramatically the size of the magnetosphere. So I was wondering, Yuri, if uh, if this condition of having the sources all at the equilibrium, uh, it doesn't imply that you need a bit of fine tuning because. The magnetic fields have to be such that you have, are always in this condition for all these ULXs. But if you decrease a little bit the field, you would still get a super Eddington mass transfer from the companion. So why do you think these sources have all such large fields such that they are in equilibrium? No, I mean, first, I think the time scale to get to the equilibrium is very short. Even for M82X2, it's 300 years. Uh, for the, those which is 10 to 40, uh, one x per second, if you just take this as a face value, the accretion rate is 30 years, okay? So basically, it's very short time. So basically, this tells you that we have to be close to the equilibrium. Because you see, in one source, you see that there is acceleration, right? So the period is changing on the time scale of 10 years. So, I mean, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> so you, you do accelerate them and, uh, uh, yeah, I don't see the. Uh, I don't see uh, how you can be far from the equilibrium. Let's put it this way. Of course, I mean we, we cannot prove that now because the source is actually strongly variable, right? You said you have luminosity 10 to 40. Then next time you observe it's 10 to 38 arcs per second. So, what is the average accretion rate? Who knows for this source, right? So we just assume that this is the highest accretion rate. Sort of defines you the equilibrium and uh, because it switches to this propeller effect. We, we believe that these huge variations are related to the propeller effect and then th that's it. Then, then, then you, you have to be close to the equilibrium. Yeah. I don't know whether I'm un answering your question. But... Sorry? So uh, this is the uh, model by Andrew King. Okay? So he, he says, uh, he basically tells you that the accretion rate, uh, the magnetic field is lower, so normal, right? On many, it's not only him, but many people say it's normal pulsar. Okay, this means that your mag if you take the luminosity as the face value, what you observe, then it means that your magnetospheric radius is uh, much smaller than the rotation radius, so you're out of the equilibrium, obviously. Okay. So uh, the spherization radius for that case is, is, is far away. So it basically, I mean, this is their model. So then you have the wind probably start blowing in, and then you can collimate. But this makes a very certain prediction that the ULEX pulsars are observed at very small inclinations. Because if you have beaming, it means, which I probably forgot to mention, if you have beaming by the wind from the accretion disk, it means that your inclination is within 10 degrees. I mean, is it reasonable for all these three sources that we have, all the three observed at 10 degrees from the axis? I'm not sure that it's reasonable even for M82X2. It's just, uh, the chances are small, and then just uh, what will be the companions uh, mass for, the, for this case? Okay? Um. The question is, um, it seems that in the CCOs, you would need to have much higher accretion rate to bury the magnetic field than uh, 100 Eddington. Supposedly, you, s you have to accrete like 10 to minus 3 solar mass in, uh, in a matter of hours. So how do you do that? You're asking me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's the model that uh, they... Uh, Invoke, you know. 
So you, you mean that for CCOs, you know, to get low magnetic field, you have to yeah, bury you, it? You yeah, in order to bury the magnetic field, you yeah. need uh, 10 to minus 3 solar masses in a matter of, I don't know, several hours. That's what I was told. <laughs> So basically, yeah, one can estimate how much superannuable it is. Yeah. I don't think he, it doesn't sound uh, reasonable to me. It's maybe. Uh, I mean, can, cannot you have just a uh, low magnetic field to start with? <laughs> you don't need to bury it to put so much mass. Yeah. Well, this is the, the question to the people who make the model. Near spin equilibrium, uh, both the torque and the mass accretion rate onto the neutron star are likely to be uh, strong functions of the fastness parameter. And possibly they are not the same function of the fastest parameter. So how do you justify then uh, uh, going from uh, uh, measurements of the spin down rate to place a bound on the mass equation rate? Okay, so uh, I understood. Uh, so actually, our group, we put no... Uh, there no uh, weight on the measurement of p dot at all. Basically, uh, there are some people who actually use the value for measuring magnetic field or the magnetospheric radius or whatever. Uh, we pay no attention to that because we believe that measured p dot is, because this is the function of two uh, torques of different signs, the measured p dot is actually the mi like the mi minimum. Yeah. So you 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 uh, okay. <laughs> How should I put it? So only the maximum possible accretion uh, p dot gives you some estimate of the minimum possible accretion rate, but the measured p dot, the smaller p dot, doesn't tell you anything. Just because in principle, you, in equilibrium, you expect zero p dot, right? So what, what, when you measure small magnet, small p dot, what does it tell you? To me, it doesn't tell anything, right? But if you have measured high, accretion, high p dot, then it tells you that, of course, you, you need to have some accretion to start with. And then you can forget about magnetic torque, just because for, for this purpose, because this gives you the minimum possible accretion rate. That's, that's, it. Yeah. that's it. Thank you, Yuri. Uh, next speaker is...